from grocery shops with no checkout staff to the taxi service with a guarantee of this zero talking are we designing a less social society welcome to round table Hello and a very warm welcome from me, David Foster. The taxi app Uber is giving users the choice of telling the driver, be quiet. Supermarkets are doing away with workers in favour of computerised checkouts. Crowds are filled with people interacting with their smartphones, not one another, unless they bump into someone. Are we actually sacrificing being sociable for the sake of convenience? <laughs> Technology is supposed to make us more connected. It's reshaping how we communicate with each other online and offline. We can stay in touch with friends and family down the road or across the world on FaceTime or Facebook. Talking to your cab driver is now completely optional. Uber recently launched its quiet preferred service where at a little extra cost, customers can avoid any small talk with the driver. Sainsbury's also opened its first self-service store in London this year. Shoppers can now scan their own items using an app and walk out without having to interact with anyone. And a study by the American Journal of Preventative Medicine found that people who use social media more often are more isolated. This study showed that if you spent over two hours a day on social media, your chances of feeling socially isolated are twice as high. So is technology getting in the way of social interaction and are we falling victims to convenience? Well, we are, of course, actually talking today to one another. And I'm joined at the round table by Elaine Boosfield, founder of Zenzone, a mental health and online well-being service. Leon Emirali joins us, entrepreneur and investor. And on the line, we have Penelope Blackmore, technology specialist and Jenny Davis, lecturer in sociology at Australian National University. Great to have you all with us. We will be doing this in person, which is fantastic. Penelope, I want to come to you first of all. Um, you used to be a, an Olympic gymnast. Now, now you write about tech and get involved in that in, in so many ways. And I was fascinated by an article you wrote which appeared in, in The Guardian here in the UK. And you said, we are becoming a lonelier society. In what way? What did you mean by that? Um, so loneliness is defined as perceived social isolation. Um, and we are seeing rising rates of loneliness in most developed countries. Um, reported figures around the US and the UK uh, indicate that we've got about 50% of our populations feeling lonely and socially isolated and disconnected from their society. And is this because of the world in which we live these days, which has become uh, making most people a little bit more remote from one another? in a sense, but actually feeling perhaps that they're connected when they're not. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the angle that I like to take is that it's not necessarily purely technology driven. While we have social media um, and the gig economy and remote work um, and all of these types of things that have been uh, proliferated by technology, which are disconnecting us, there's also things like family and religion, which are on the decline. Um, so where we used to go to church, we're now on our iPhone. So um, I think absolutely technology has a, an enormous role to play. Um, we're seeing now that we're going to fuel restaurants because we can have things delivered to our home. Um, we're seeing companies like Peloton, which is a at-home fitness uh, software um, and, and programs that's been valued at four billion US dollars, and that's taking fitness out of uh, sports clubs and public gyms into the home. So um, I'm, I have a personal concern, I guess, that uh, we're somehow streamlining our lives to the point where we're not able to interact with people anymore. OK, Jenny, I'll come to you in a little bit to talk about your idea that this could actually boast, bolster st uh, sociability. It has its downsides, but it has its, its pluses as well. But, Elaine, in, in your work on mental health, particularly with young people. I'm pleased to see your business is, do, is doing well because it's got more staff, but I suppose in a way that indicates it's a bigger problem. But I, in your encounters with this sort of thing, um, tech loneliness, yes. what do people tell you? 
Well, they don't say that technology is making them lonely. They definitely don't say that. I mean, one of the things I would say is on our service in particular, I think, in fact, young people often tell us, especially in terms of peer support, they actually come to create a safe community. They actually come to share stories with each other, share strategies with each other, and to actually kind of engage in what we call digital altruism. There's a lot of giving, a lot of hope giving, a lot of hope sharing, a sharing of hope. So I would say, that, 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 you know, from our experience, that technology, the, the way that we use technology certainly doesn't create loneliness. It actually allows people to connect with each other. But is it a little bit like sort of a glass of wine is good for you, but uh, five or six bottles probably is going to do you a lot of harm? Yes. It's, it's, you have to yes. use this in moderation and understand what you're doing. I think, I think, I think the secret is about knowing why, you're do, knowing why you're developing something. And I think that's the big question. As a society, morally, we have to ask ourselves, why are we developing this technology? What's it for? And for us, we, the reason we use technology was to try to reach more people who are struggling and to actually help them connect with each other. So morally speaking, we're not there to create dependency. We're not mm. there to stop people connecting. We're not there to say technology should replace community. So we're we're using it in a specific way. That you're you're yeah. using technology to help people who might be isolated because of technology. Well, I don't know whether people are isolated because of technology. I think there's all sorts of reasons for why society is changing. I think technology is one aspect, but there's lots and lots of reasons for why society is changing. We live in a much more polarised society, much bigger gaps between rich and poor. We live in, you know, austere times. There's lots of reasons, I think, to, to suggest why we, we're sort of... Uh, facing, if you like, a kind of a crisis of identity or some sort of... We're going to talk like, in a change. little while about yeah. inconvenience, the brilliance of inconvenience, which I know, yeah. uh, Penny, is one thing that you've talked about. But I want to ask you, Leon, first of all, you don't believe that human interaction is going away, that it's not going anywhere. You do, can't you see things changing this way? Well, undoubtedly things have changed, but I don't actually think that it's technology that's causing the problems here. It's human nature to sometimes want to shut yourself off from the world. We've all had days when we've woken up and wanted to stay in our pyjamas, and that's fine. And all that's happening is technology is allowing us to do those things that we want to do occasionally as human beings. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I do think things have changed, but I'd argue actually it's for the better. And as Elaine says, we are more connected, we are more informed than we've ever been at any point in history. And we have technology, social media to thank for that. OK, Je Jenny, what's this doing to us socially? Yeah, well, so I think um, one issue is that we often start with this question of, is technology good or bad? Is it making us more social or less social? Social, And I think a better kind of orienting question is, how is it changing the structure of interaction? For whom and under what circumstances? Um, and so I think what we see is technology has taken a multitude of forms and we see a lot of different kinds of people using it in a lot of different kinds of ways. Um, in some instances, uh, it can be it can be isolating. Um, it can be it can support um, staring at your phone, for instance, at the bus stop instead of that kind of chance encounter with a stranger. On the other hand, um, it can be a way for those who have struggled to find community to, to do so and to reach out and to get help and to get the kinds of social support that may not otherwise be available. Um, so I think we need to look at it kind of as a more uh, holistic picture of how rather than kind of a black and white, good or bad. Quick, quick one, no, Elaine, I, before I totally, we go back to Penny, because no, I know she's got a story to tell us. Yes, no, I totally agree. I, I totally agree with what was, um, Jenny said. You know, that, yeah. I, I think that's... I think you've hit it on the, on the he nail on the head, really. I mean, I think, I think, you know, there are some issues, a way that some of the big technology giants, they have definitely created the te their, their kind of creations, the technology creations, to be addictive. The, 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 the it's almost a world without oxygen, isn't it? it? They have done that. We need to learn to and come I guess, up to breathe. I, you know, and I think, I think, and I think that's not good. I don't, I don't think yeah. that is good. I think there are issues there. But I think, I think we have to start. I think technology can be really good. It can be really positive. But we have to kind of start off with the right moral compass. Right. So this what is it not is we want to achieve. just about technology. No. It, it's 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 about yeah. human interaction, as, as Jenny Absolutely. said. Yeah. And, and Penny, I know you've got a, a story to tell about chance encounters. Um, you wrote about Uber and the ability to be able to say, you know, please, mate, you know, put a sock in it, shut up, <laughs> be quiet, thank you very much, indeed, I need my own time. But you resisted that temptation when you were in an Uber car in Germany. What did you do? 
Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I had a conversation with an Uber driver, and as I mentioned in the article, this is not a life-changing uh, thesis. I'm not saying that by talking to Uber drivers, we're going to have this revelation in uh, connectedness. But what I am saying is that within the psychological community, it is established that weak ties, which are acquaintances, so these might be your barista or your yoga teacher or your Uber driver, so people who you don't necessarily know, but having relationships and having connectedness with people who fall into that weak tie category um, can enormously increase your sense of connectedness. So uh, I guess what I was trying to say is that these small talk interactions, they seem so pointless and so useless. Um, but we have to remember that human beings don't know what we want. We don't know what's good for us. Um, and often a lot of self-reported data um, is completely wrong. We're not very good at being self-aware. I want to get into the idea of this, this being um, a world in which our choices are being taken away from us because we're being given more choices. Um, you talked about the convenience store. Jenny, and I, when I first went to live in America, I went into one, and I would say it was an inconvenience store because I had far, far too much choice. All I wanted was to go in there and pick up a salad dressing, and there were 20 or 30. It confused silly old me, and it did every single time. Now, this is what is happening, isn't it? We're giving, being given too much choice. You know, do you want your house cleaned by a machine that goes around 24 hours a day? Do you want your lawn mowed by something like this? We're, the little irritations that Penny talks about there, those little things that involve weak ties, are, are vital and they're being taken away. I, I don't agree with that, David. Actually, I think we are given uh, choice to allow us to get on to do the things that matter. And but if it takes you 10 minutes instead of 30 seconds to make a choice, well, you know, and you've got 20 choices a day... Sometimes when you sit and watch Netflix, you want to decide what film you want to watch and you can't because there is so much. And I do, I do agree in that thesis. But ultimately, technology is giving us time back. Technology is selling us time. And that is it's the biggest commodity. Than ever. Say that again, <laughs> Betty, yeah. I, I, I was just saying that we're busier than ever. Um, and we're finding ways to fill those gaps with various uh, tasks that we think are going to fulfill us, but in fact, they're not. We have epidemic levels of mental health issues. We have epidemic levels of depression. We have epidemic levels of loneliness. And so what you're saying doesn't really tie into any of those statistics. So do finish, Leon. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's, it's great that you threw your thoughts in, Benny. Don't, don't <laughs> stop. But, I mean, he was mid-flow. I, I think it's too, <laughs> it's, too, it's too early to tell on the impact that social media and technology is having on us. And I think you know, we all assumed that... Uh, social media was bad for children's mental health. There was a study out last week or last month by Oxford University who said actually it has a negligible impact on people's lives. So I think th the stats and the data is, is there, but it's not accurate enough for us to make a definitive conclusion. And I think that, you know, as I say, we, we use Uber, not because it's a taxi, but because it sells us back time. It's quicker and it's easier. So we are taking back that time to put it into work, to put it into leisure, to put it into relationships. But, but, the, but, but the argument here is that the little inconveniences of everyday life, just getting on with things, should fill your time and make you feel quite satisfied because you've achieved something, rather than having so much time that you don't really know what to do with yourself and you feel not so good. Yeah, you know, there is, there is an element of that. Yeah, yeah. But no, go on, Elaine, go on. As I was saying, I've never used Uber in my life. Never used it. And I use I don't drive. Well, it's just like a taxi, I, isn't it? Only I know cheaper it is, but, no, but I, then I've good reason. I, I, I don't drive. Mm. So it, and I come down to London quite a lot for meetings and stuff. And if I don't use the tram and I use a taxi, I use the same taxi firm I've used the last 30 years. And I do that out of loyalty, really, because they're a local taxi firm. And believe you me, you couldn't tell any of the drivers I, that drive me to shut up. <laughs> they wouldn't shut up <laughs> if you paid them. They're real chatterboxes. I absolutely love getting in the taxi with my taxi driver. But isn't it those little away. bits and yes, bobs, those little yes, greetings, morning, it governor, I, that it sort is. of thing? That I, we it don't is. want more time. Whether you're sort of sitting in silence and it takes you 10 minutes to get to the station, or whether you're talking to somebody, it's still going to take you 10 minutes to get to the station. This is what you do in those 10 minutes. Well, you know, and, and actually chatting to but people. Let's bring, bring Jenny Quite back a nice in, thing, you, you've, really. You've been it's... nodding at a couple of points and looking <laughs> like you want to, want to say something. Yeah, well, so I'm, the, I'm glad that the Oxford study was brought up. I was going to bring that up as well. So, so though there are high rates of mental ill health, um, there was a big, uh, quite robust, statistically sophisticated study done about 
um, youth technology and mental health. And what it found was that technology use explained about 1% of the variation. So about 1% of what we know about sort of this decline in youth mental health can be explained by technology. And so to sort of put it up as this um, uh, monument of social ills is, is troubled by that study. And that's not to say that there aren't other studies or that there aren't personal experiences that could um, point to technology yeah. as troublesome. So, so when somebody says to you, or the subject comes up, oh, this tech world, this modern world is driving us all insane, it's, it's isolating people, it's making them lonely, it's not creating a better world, what is your answer to that? Because mental health problems have gone up. What is your answer? I mean, my answer is that the world is big and complex and there's a lot of factors at play. Technology becomes a very easy and tempting boogeyman because it's something new and because it's something tangible to grab onto. And if that's the problem, then we can fix it. But of course, it's much bigger than that. It's about the changing structure of work. It's about political polarization. It's about um, instability of jobs. Uh, it's about increasing pressures among, uh, among young people to live up to quite difficult um, standards of achievement in school, in their friend groups. However, so however, and I'll throw this open to, to everybody here. Those standards to which they are expected to aspire are often peer-driven, and peer-driven because they are out there in the world which where we're communicating much more, but not actually communicating. I think, I mean, I, I, from my experience of working with young people, young people are pretty smart, actually. And, and when we first started uh, with ZenZone, the early adopters were young people under the age of 18. And when you talk to young people, they are much smarter at knowing when to unplug themselves from social media. There's a lot more unplugging that's going on, a lot more awareness that the kind of the wonderful image you see of the perfect body or the perfect face, it's likely to have been photoshopped. Young people are actually quite savvy. They kind of you've know got, this is the case. You've got more old people coming to you now, haven't you? We've got, we work with adults as with, well. With adults. Yes, and do yeah. you think they have different issues? Well, the adults who come to us are usually coming to us with quite, um, not really to do with, so they, they come to us with the stuff that they've always come to us with, really, depression, domestic violence. So, so it is a generational problems. thing? Perhaps, perhaps. I mean, what I, I wouldn't, is it a generational thing? I would say, I would say that young people are pretty, that there's a lot more awareness I've noticed in this, the latest generation of young people that, that, that photographs are photoshopped and that images are perhaps been doctored. We're talking about doctored. isolation, aren't we? And we are, but, but we're talking about... feeling of self-worth yes, as well, yeah, and that, that yeah, self, relates to, yeah. to what you're talking yes, about. Yes, doesn't yes, yes. Yeah. it? Yeah, self-worth and identity and... Uh, I mean, I think expectations, I think a lot of that is to do with ch the changing economy and the changes in the educational system. I don't think that's so much to do with technology mm. at all. Le Leon, your thoughts in a minute, but let, let's go to Penny here, because um, Jenny says technology is not the bogeyman. Uh, it, it, it could have a bad role to play. It can have a good role to play. But what, in your opinion, um, is, is causing us to have uh, so many issues that you notice with regards to mental health and loneliness? What do you think it is, if it's not this? I, I think that we need to make an incredibly important distinction between technology and the major monopoly uh, players in the te technology industry at the moment. So there's Facebook, Twitter, Uber, which are multi, multi, multi billion dollar companies, and they're contributing to this kind of convenience economy, which I think is a negative thing. However, technology on the whole, that's something like this computer, which is allowing me to speak to you now. That's a wonderful thing. So. I work in technology, I'm a technology specialist. I would never insinuate that technology is to blame for anything. Um, however, I do think that uh, what we need to be aware of is that a company like Facebook will never regulate itself. Um, we expect the government to protect us from alcohol and tobacco and junk food. So we should expect the government to protect us from uh, the dangers of social media the dangers of this convenience economy um, and the dangers of things like remote work. Um, is it healthy for someone to work at home by themselves all day? That's a question that, that we that, should that, be That is something worth discussing, but for a lot of people, you know, it is fantastic and, and, and it helps them to, to have a family life as well. So that, that's, that's an interesting one. We will talk about that 
another time. I think we'll have a programme about that one, whether it's good to work from home or not. But, but, but everybody was nodding as you were talking, Penny. You, you probably couldn't see that. Uh, Leon, Leon, what did you want to say? I, I, I do agree, and I think regulation will come, and, and it, is, it is to an extent uh, inevitable. We can't get to a point, though, where the internet or technology, social media, has given us this massive access to, uh, to, to choice and freedom and all the rest of it, and then for that to be dictated on us by governments or, or public sector bodies. You know, I, I think that's a slippery slope to get down. And I think we have to understand that people had reservations about Elvis shaking his hips in the 50s and thought that would poison minds. We were told video games in the 90s would be the downfall of society. None of that came true. And I think that to an extent, we're seeing the same thing with these technologies and social media. It's but still a, but too a, early to tell. Cliff and a house are not washed into the sea overnight. Perhaps it is insidious. Perhaps it is Elvis. Perhaps it is the other things that you mentioned, the video games. It's all... Yes. Chipping away at society. Yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I like Elvis, by the way. I Me like too. Elvis too. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, I think, um, I think, sort of uh, Penny's point about the big boys, about about Facebook in particular, Twitter, the way that they are designed, the way Google is designed, is problematic. It, it's not done with the. I hate to sort of use this word, but it's not done with the best moral moral purposes. Really, it is. To, it's to keep us hooked. It's to keep us addicted. It's to keep us keep returning. Is it to stop it's, us thinking for ourselves? Perhaps. Perhaps. I think. I think it's to sell advertising. Really, it's to make money, and that's what. It, like the eye, eyeballs on the page is what makes the money, and 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 I, so I think you know. I'm not. I think there are issues to do with that, and perhaps some regulation. Yeah. We're all sitting helpful. around here, well, you, you happen to be in different locations in different parts of the world, you two, but we're all sitting around here talking about it. We are thinking for ourselves, but Jenny, and this is for everybody, Jenny, are we in danger of being told what to think and no longer having to make choices for ourselves because other people are doing it for us? We say it's easy that way, but in fact it's quite dangerous. Well, I think uh, that potentially overstates the case just a little bit. Um, something like Google, in a sense, does tell us what to think because it creates an information economy in which information is presented to us as objective when, in fact, it's highly curated and highly normalized. Um, at the same time, we just talked moments ago about an abundance of choice where all of a sudden we have too much freedom so that it's stifling. And so certainly the way that we understand the world and the decisions we make are shaped by these big conglomerate um, companies that have probably undue power and not quite enough regulation. At the same time, I don't know that that undermines entirely our capacity for autonomous thought. Yeah, but it erodes at it. What, Penny, what do you think? Does it? Uh, I, I think that we should be more interested in the idea that um, we are being kind of locked in these algorithmic bubbles. Um, this is something that the US saw very strongly before the election of Donald Trump. Um, people in the liberal Tune, tune in next week. That's one of the programs we're doing. <laughs> okay, great. That's not just for you. That's for everybody out there as well. <laughs> um, but we, we very strongly saw that people in the demographic uh, uh, sorry, the Democrat demographic um, weren't aware of all the other opinions that were circulating on platforms like Facebook or Google because they've been locked into an, a kind of an echo chamber of their um, of opinions that reflected their own state of mind. Quick, so quick thoughts as, as we come to the end of the program. It's gone very, very quickly. Are we being isolated by the modern world? Leon, first of all. No, I, I don't agree. I think we need to get away from this myth that somehow before technology we were all chatting to each other on the tube and on the bus. We weren't. We were still buried in newspapers and magazines. The only thing that's changed is we now have a phone in our pocket instead. So I, you know, I think we have to get away from this, this myth that somehow it was all rosy beforehand. Technology is merely just a progression in society, and it's human nature that's the problem, not the tech. OK, I'd like to see the monopoly of Facebook and Google broken. I'd like to see more smaller players and more varied choice for people. I would so more I would, choice. Okay. Yeah, I would like, but I'd like to see the monopoly broken. Yeah. It does worry me that that perhaps they have too much power. But but I, I I also from my own line of work, I can I see how technology ends isolation and connects people and gives people strength, resilience, and creates community as well. So we have to live with it, and yeah. we have to but yeah. try and influence it in a way that yes. makes it change and yes. and, and evolve. Yes. That's, that would be my conclusion, yes.
Yeah. I'm talking about evolution. Um, Jenny, did sorry, did you want a final word, quick, quickly? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, I think I would just say um, I would like to see us stop thinking about technology and, and social interaction in face-to-face -face zero sum. Um, often they supplement and complement one another in a way that creates kind of a more robust and changed uh, interaction environment. And so um, the picture is a bit a bit more complicated than it's often presented. Smashing. Listen, I, I've really enjoyed having all four of you on the programme. Do you remember I mentioned at the beginning that people were on their smartphones and they bumped into you? Yes. Yeah? Talking about evolution, have you noticed now that 15 years ago people would bump into you, but now people can be looking like this down at their phone and they know when you're coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? And they get out of the way. We are all changing as human beings and technology is making us do that. Listen, thank you once again. Thank you for watching. From me, David Foster, from the team, we hope to have your company next time on Roundtable, but goodbye for now.